Well, as we're talking about this next series uh, that we have, we started last week on going through the book of Ephesians chapter by chapter. Today's chapter two, we're calling it the power of love because what Paul believed is that what happened on the cross, it doesn't just change our lives, it changed the fabric of reality itself. And I do believe it's this power that we have to lean on when you see what's going on in the world. Um, before we get started, I just wanted you to at least know about there are some churches in, in the Rumson area that are uh, planning on doing a prayer vigil for uh, Israel and Gaza and what's going on. So just know that if and when that happens, we're going to send out in our Tower Talk an email blast so that you can attend if you want to be a part of that prayer vigil. Because I don't know what else to do other than to pray and to help however we can. It's, when you're in situations like what we see in the world, it's, you feel very powerless and to remember that we're not. There's great power in God's people praying, praying for peace, praying for change. Let's not lose hope. Let's not grow weary in doing good. Let us keep praying for what's happening. So just know that that's coming. The power of love. Huey Lewis every time. Every time I say it. <laughs> and I think actually the band's preparing to do that song for like one of the preludes at the end. And, uh, but it was Dan who told me, he's like, the reason we never done the song before is because there's this lyric in it, and he told me what it was. I was like, ooh. <laughs> and so they're going to change the lyric. So anybody that's paying attention, you'll see what they're doing. <laughs> so thank you, Dan. But um, I thought that would be fun to do when we close the series. Last week, we started this whole thing off by saying where it all begins in our understanding of faith and understanding of God, and this was chapter one of Ephesians, it's all about identity. Who do we say that we are versus who does God say that we are? Because we don't know who you are, it's really hard to move forward in your life. This is true in just about everything. I know there's some college students home. Welcome home. And I hope they have a great rest of your semester. Um, but you sort of know that like, until you choose your major, you're sort of stuck because your pathway is dependent upon that choice. And how for a lot of us in our lives, we're waiting on the next thing, and we're a little bit powerless because we're not confident in who we are in Jesus Christ. Once that's identity parts nailed down, you could start to move forward. We talked about that last week. Some key scriptures from last week. He chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, oh, by the way, holy and blameless, we're going to come back to that. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ. So what happens, and we talked about this again if you want to go back and listen to last week, is all of us have the opportunity if we want to be adopted sons and daughters, children of God, heirs to an inheritance that is beyond comprehension. It's sort of like I was thinking about, you know, the musical Annie, Little Orphan Annie, she had a tough life, but then she kind of did okay. I'm, like, I'm sure it was hard. She's probably going to need to talk through it a bit later, but Daddy Warbucks adopted her. I don't think she has anything to worry about ever. And if that's amazing, what is it this inheritance that we get from God? Not money, not those sorts of riches, but the rich inheritance of his glory, not just now, but forever. We are all adopted heirs to our heavenly father because of what Jesus did on the cross. We are now, now we know who we are. We are the chosen ones. We are the chosen ones. That was Paul's big point, said it's not just about God's chosen people in the past, the Jewish people. He has now opened up the floodgates to who's chosen. It's anybody that puts their faith in him. You're the chosen one. God chooses you, and that's how adoption works. He chooses to love first, and then to change your status. You are now an official heir of your heavenly Father. Because this is what Paul believed. Paul believed that when Jesus went to the cross and died for us, that love had the power to change everything about who we are. And this has huge implications for us. We'll get to that in a second. Now today is, it's kind of deep water theologically, but it, I think it lands in our everyday life in a really powerful way. 
So hang in there, take some notes, slap yourself or your neighbor, keep them awake if you see them. If you got to go out and get a shot of coffee, and it's, it's, I get it. But let's talk about this. The very first lesson that God gives to Moses, remember I said we were chosen before the creation world to be holy and blameless. Holy and blameless. The first lesson that God gives to Moses through the burning bush, which, by the way, I love how we just read that like it's nothing. Oh, and the burning bush said, as if we wouldn't all be super freaked out if an on-fire bush started talking to us. (laughs) But the first thing he does is say, do not come any closer. God said, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Why does God do that? What God's trying to get us to understand is he is holy without sin. And if we want to have a relationship with him, we must be the same. He does not want sin in his presence. He is holy. Now, we could spend a lot of time, that's a, sort of a mind bender the more you think about that. And what he told the Jewish people was, Hey, if you follow this law, it's going to help you understand what, what, what's the standard of righteousness. But back in Jesus' day, and of course the Jewish belief was that the law, which were the Ten Commandments, and all the interpretations of the commandments from rabbis for generations and generations. So you had, by the time of Jesus, he had some 638 commandments that you must follow in order to be holy and blameless, in order to be righteous right before God. They believed that it was the law and obedience to the law that gets you to holiness. What Paul's about to tell them is that that was wrong. It doesn't get you to holiness. It just teaches you what holiness is and what God's standard is. Are you supposed to try to follow it? Of course you are. But that's not why you're saved by God. Your ability to execute the law in your life isn't it. Here's... The Ten Commandments are always, I think, misunderstood or the commandments of God. They're meant to free us. Case in point, we just extremely recently got a dog. And I I I totally forgot the commitment of the dog (laughs) and how much work that was going to be. It's all good. It's all good. Great dog. But it had me thinking about when I was growing up with dogs in Pennsylvania in the Poconos, we built a fence around the back and in this fence it's great because listen if we didn't have the fence it would just open the door okay go to the bathroom good luck hope you find your way back like, there's a lot of danger out there they could get hit by a car they could not find their way home they could uh, so many things could happen there's a lot of danger if we didn't have the fence put the fence in and theoretically the fence gives them a perimeter and they could run free all within that and be safe from the dangers outside. In a way, that fence is like the law. God gives us the law to say, hey, human beings, live in this way. You're going to be free. You're going to love it. It's going to be great. But I've given you barriers so that this doesn't lead to death. You will have life and life eternal if you live in this way. But what do we do? We do what my dogs did. They jumped the fence. (laughs) A lot. My, My dad spent a weekend making the fence higher He lets the dogs out. They jump over. It was actually, we were all cheering for the dogs because it was just sort of amazing. But they came back oftentimes with like porcupine quills. Bad. Yeah, that's bad when that happens. Lots of dangers. This is like us. The fence doesn't get us to God. It just shows us the barrier. We jump it every day with our sin. The law itself, the fence, isn't what gets us to be holy and blameless. This is what Paul is about to explain to them, and it just totally blows up their whole world. And there are huge implications for us, for what's going on in the world, for how we live our lives. Let's get into it. This is chapter 2. We're going to read all of chapter 2 today. As for you, he's talking to, remember he's writing a letter to the church, church in Ephesus, everybody. It's meant to be read out loud in one shot. It says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh 
and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And I'm wondering as he says this to this Jewish and Gentile church, if all the Jewish Christians in the room were like, really all of us were dead in our transgressions? Not us. We were the ones doing it right. We were following the law. We, were, we had dietary restrictions. We had puritary law, purity laws. And we were doing all these things. I think you mean the Gentiles. You know, the riffraff. All of us were dead in our transgressions and sins. They had a very transactional view of God. I obey, therefore I'm accepted. And I wish I could say that died with the Pharisees. But sadly, actually tragically, I know a lot of Christians that still live like this is true. My relationship with God is transactional. I do this, I expect God to do this. Or maybe it's like, hey, I went to church. I gave money when the pastor said to give money. I did all the things, so how come I got sick? How come that thing, how come I lost my job? How come my relationship with my kids is going south? What's going on? God, I did all that stuff for you. And then when you really unpack those statements, you realize, like, maybe I didn't do all that much. But we get very transactional. And that's what it was. Tim Keller, whom I loved, had this, uh, he said that religion is when you have this mindset. I obey, therefore I'm accepted. That's religion. Religion are, is the rules that you must follow in order to get right with God. When there's no amount of getting right trying that's going to work, it is by grace we have been saved through faith. It's what God did for us. What we couldn't do on our own, God did on our behalf. It is grace, not works. It is a gift, not a wage. And when you start letting this get into your life, when you start living your life this way, what you discover is that you have a transformational view. I'm accepted, therefore I obey. I'm accepted, therefore I'm going to do whatever God wants me to do because I'm so grateful that he saved me, that he saved a wretch like me. That I want to honor him with my life. Plus, he may know a thing or two about my purpose, about my path. I want to follow what he wants for me. Why? Because I know I'm going to experience more joy, more purpose, more faith, more hope, more everything if I follow the life that God's designed me to live. But I don't do it so that I'm going to earn points. God's not working on that system. God came down to us and showered all the points on us anyway. It is by grace we have been saved. So imagine the Jewish ear hearing this at the time in the early Christian church. And then imagine how they were ready to hear about the Gentiles. So, you know, Paul, Paul reads his letter, right? Or the letter is read and get to this point. And all the Jewish Christians in the room are getting very uncomfortable. They're like, but at least the Gentiles are going to get theirs. What about the Gentiles? They're a mess. Okay, let's talk about adoption. Sometimes you get adopted and you can't control who you're adopted to. Like, maybe the family is a little weird. I don't know. Maybe not everybody totally gets along. Or, you know, sort of like in-laws. I mean, my in-laws, in case you're watching, are fantastic. I'm just saying, sometimes there's a little friction. There's like the uncle at Thanksgiving that nobody wants to talk to. 
because you're going to hear about whatever. You don't even want to sit over there. It's like being a Raiders fan. You seen some of these fans? <laughs> yeah. They're different. I love you, Raiders fans, too. I love you. But they're different. Listen, there are some members of the family you usually try to avoid because we're different. Now, imagine this. So the, all the Jewish Christians in the room in Ephesus, hey, we belong here. Everybody else is like, you're allowed here. And Paul really, really addresses this in a big way. So if God's own people were dead in their sins, then Gentiles are really bad. They don't even have the law. They don't even have the fence. They don't even know there's a fence. So what extra steps will they need to take? And here's where Paul absolutely explodes everything they thought they knew. And like I said, this has implications for everything. He says this. Therefore, remember that formerly, you who are Gentiles by birth, oh, here it comes, you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Interesting he says that. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. And I wonder if there are some people, at least in their heads, were like, yes, preach it, brother. And here's where everything changes. But now, but now, something different's happening. Something has changed. It's not what you're expecting. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. What's he mean? He means a lot of things here, but one of the things he means is peace between us and God. The sin barrier that exists between us. He becomes our peace. His righteousness, his holiness, is transferred to us as if we were holy and blameless. Our holiness is given, it's not earned. He himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one. Jew, Gentile, two groups one. And has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. What? Setting aside the law. Do you hear that? That would be crazy talk for them. He's setting aside the law in his flesh. It means he took the requirements of the law, he put it upon himself, and he died on the cross with it so that we would all be covered. That's why legalism in the church is nonsense. That's why us earning points and some sort of point system to God is nonsense. We receive everything, whether we deserve it or not, because Jesus deserved it. And it's his blood that covers us. What's wild is this dividing wall of hostility. Some of you have heard me say this before. It's actually a wall in the temple, scholars believe, that existed between the court of the Gentiles and the inner courts where Jewish men and women could go. The idea was the closer you go toward the center of the temple, the more holy it is until you get all the way to the Holy of Holies and so on and so forth. That's another message. But the Gentiles could only be in the outer court. And there was a wall that existed that's not too much higher than these front walls here. And it had an inscription on it that went something like this. This is, uh, was found in Turkey. So archaeology uncovered this. Uh, no foreigner is allowed past this point on penalty of death. Gentiles out. You are not allowed to go any further. The dividing wall of hostility. This is torn down by the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus did what not even the law could do, brought us near and tears down the wall. There is no more wall that divides Jew and Gentile. All have the same access to the Father because of grace. I think sometimes if, if we get into a season where we're living very transactionally with God, okay, God, I really want this to happen, so I'm going to be good. Or, or it's sometimes the other way. God, bad things are happening. You must be punishing me because I'm not good. 
all equally garbage. We are saved by grace through faith. So, by setting aside in his flesh the law, his purpose was to create, and this has just this has been so crazy for them to hear, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two. There's no such thing now as Jew and Gentile. Now you're now one new humanity in Jesus Christ. Whoever you were doesn't even matter anymore as much as who you are, but what he did for you. thus making peace. And in one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Paul's whole point here, the point of Ephesians, Jesus made Jews and Gentiles one. You now have the same roots. Those roots are Jesus Christ. And I wonder... Again, what were the Jewish Christians in the room hearing? Maybe they were experiencing outrage or injustice or a loss of identity. But Paul was clear that you have a new purpose. You have a new identity. You are one new humanity in Jesus. Just to get a sense of how crazy this is. As you know, we're about to come to a new election cycle. (laughs) Boy, I can't wait. (laughs) I don't, I can't think, uh, listen, Republicans and Democrats in this country, I, it's so contentious, it's so out of control, that they can't, there's no, not even a conversation anymore. And, and this, on both sides of the aisle, one party will denounce what the other party wants, who just fought for that six months ago. But because the other one wants it, they don't want it anymore. And it keeps going back and forth. And listen, I don't need to tell you this, you know. I long for the days where political rivals could argue it out and then go out to dinner. And now it's not even close. But they'd be like, okay, uh, for president, we have a Republican candidate, we have a Democratic candidate. And they, they go live on TV to the world. They said, hey, look, listen, we have some serious differences. We got to work those out. But you know, as we got to talking, we each fill each other's gaps a bit in how we see things. So here's our new thing. We're going to be co-presidents. So we want to introduce to you the Republic-Cratic Party. And and, and we're just going to lead together. People would lose their minds. It would be chaos. And if that's crazy, imagine Paul's letter saying, Jews and Gentiles, yeah, you're together now. Insane. Or maybe think of national rivals, whomever we might think of Russia, we might think whoever it is. Oh, no, no. You're the same now. Now, not, ju- not for nothing, it's only through Jesus Christ. This is how we have hope for supernatural peace around the world, whether it's Israel or anywhere else. We believe that if there is any peace possible, it's probably not going to be by human hands. It's got to be by the blood of Jesus Christ, somehow, some way. We believe that that is how we get peace. The power of him crucified. Where we are one body, one foundation, one new humanity, one holy temple. All who are far away and all who were near are now one. Maybe another way of saying it is the ground is level at the foot of the cross. You have just as much right to the Heavenly Father as a pastor, priest, monk, nun, whomever you hold to be religious, Mother Teresa, you have the same access because of what Jesus did on the cross. Don't let people say things that make you think otherwise. It's a lie. 
Now, does God just not care about our behavior? Well, of course not. He wants it. We can still keep wrecking ourselves the more we jump the fence. And it's not the life that he designed for us. So yeah, of course he matters. But maybe for not the reason you thought. I'm accepted, therefore I obey. And we all are one family. We each have a vital part to play. So as we close this message today, just a couple of things. The power of love burns down and it builds up. Just to review, the first thing is, it's all grace. But now you have been brought near. It is by grace that you have been saved. Not by works. It's by what he did, not what you do. Second, he is our peace between us and God and between us and one another. There is no dividing wall. Everybody has access by one blood of Jesus. And then third, as a result, I believe humility and gratitude should be our MO. What do I mean? Is that if we really get it, we should know that we didn't deserve it. And if we know we didn't deserve it, we should be so humble in how we interact with everybody in the world. And listen, I'm sorry, I'm just picking on the Christians in the room. A lot of times we're not humble and we're not nice and we're super judgmental. Like, what is that? Why? That's not our job. God will judge just fine without us. Our job is to show the power of love demonstrated in our own lives first and then made available to everybody else in our life. Yes, we'll have disagreements. Yes, there are things we'll believe that other people believe. It shouldn't stop us from loving. So I want to ask you this question in closing, and that's this. Do you find yourself living by transactional religion or by transformational grace? If it's the first, you don't have to keep living like that. There's something better. There's freedom in knowing you're forgiven. There's life in the relationship with God. This is probably the hardest thing to explain if you've been going to church your whole life and, but maybe not much else as far as feeling like you're following Jesus. That's okay. Just know that God has so much more for you though. When you try to have that relationship with him, it really does transform you. That is the power of love. Amen.